Um, it's bizarre that I hear myself, but anyway. Um, I'm Anne-Marie Melster, the co-founder and executive director of Artport Making Waves. We are an international arts organization um, doing interdisciplinary work since 2005 at the intersection of art, science, education, dedicated to climate change and ocean protection. And um, we were invited to do this event, this activity today by the WWF. I want to thank our partners. And um, I started this We Are Ocean Global program in 2019. We are endorsed by UNESCO until 2030 as part of the UN Ocean Decade. And we did already organize several projects in Berlin, in Marseille, in Venice, in Vancouver, in several countries on the Wadden Sea coast, in the Netherlands and Germany. Uh, in summer, we went to Honduras in Central America, and many more projects are in the pipeline. And today, we are here with We Are Ocean Montreal. Uh, the idea of We Are Ocean is to bring the idea of ocean protection closer to civil society through artistic projects which build a bridge between art, science, and uh, civil society. And our main goal is youth empowerment. So we work mainly with um, school students, but also university students all over the planet. And we always have our local partners. So we don't go to the countries and try to teach younger people what it means, ocean protection and ocean literacy. But we always work with uh, local communities, local organizations, local uh, teachers, and um, today we are here with Toitonat uh, Si Swiss or Si Swiss. I always pronounce it in a Swiss way. She pronounces it in an English way. Um, she is um, from British Columbia, from Vancouver. She belongs to the Squamish nation. And we invited her already uh, to We Are Ocean Vancouver. And um, she is going to present today um, she will explain that. She works, she is also called the plant diva, which means that she works with botany. She is uh, an expert in botany. She is not only a visual artist uh, in different media, but she is really an expert in uh, healing plants and specifically the ones in British Columbia. And um, she is able to explain also the function of plants in coastal areas, in the riparian zone, for example. And um, she is going to do a workshop today with us and a performance um, to bring us closer to plants, to bring us closer to, um, to ocean protection through plants and to traditional knowledge, uh, specifically in British Columbia, but you work also in Montreal very often, so you are also familiar with the region here. I think you can do the workshop without your mask, maybe that makes you feel more comfortable. So, um, yes, I'm glad that you came. Maybe we can move everybody a little bit closer together. Um, maybe not that close because of our restrictions, but maybe like, yeah, a little bit with the chairs towards the plants and, um, and feel relaxed, feel like at home. It's nothing formal. It's going to... We want you to ins in we want to inspire you a little bit to come closer to to um, well to biodiversity of course. So um, I give the word to to Cees and um, she's going to inspire you a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and half and squallowin, and one oxed and squallowin tit seats. Um, like to acknowledge that we're on the uh, ancestral lands of the uh, Gayan Gahage, the Mohawk people, and the Anishinaabe people. Um, I've been told that this place is known as Teo Teage, um, and Munyang in Anishinaabe. Um, I find it really significant that I'm here uh, in this area because uh, as well as my own teachers at home, the elders where I come from, they uh, have taught me, but one of my 
most influential teacher is, is a Mohawk woman who really got me on the earth, uh, introducing me to medicines and, and explaining their personalities as plants and as spiritual beings, living beings. And I have spent um, 35 years since meeting her out in the community teaching predominantly young people. I, uh, only two weeks ago I was with uh, pre-kindergarten children, so they're all about up to my waist. <laughs> but bringing them into the forest and the thing I do most regularly is to bring people onto the land. And when people think that it's a funny thing to hug a tree, I actually turn it around for people and I, and I get, I've had sometimes 40 people in the woods holding trees. And that's because they are our ancestors. So wherever you go in the world, when you are in the natural world, you are with your ancestors. And when you are feeling disconnected from who you are in your spirit, you can go into the forest and touch, touch even ferns and enjoy what the medicine is that they bring to us. So, of course, it's winter, it's December. Trying to find indigenous plants uh, was a real fun adventure, but my colleague was right up there with me. I actually just shared with my friends that, you know, when you are really being taken care of by someone who calls themselves a curator, they don't always really take care of their artists, but I can honestly say with a big heart that my dear friend Anne-Marie has really guided me, not only here, but in the last few years that we've worked together and created ocean literacy uh, curriculum to deliver to children and students around the Pacific Northwest Coast and to help them have a dialogue with the, with the shoreline and with the forest. And when we think about, when we look at the ocean and its beauty, and we look to the mountains and we see the glaciers, we can understand the relationship of the ocean and the mountains. Because the glaciers, they melt and they become the veins of the forest, which are represented as rivers, until they come back to the ocean and then they evaporate into the steam, the fog, the mist, the snow. And so we are constantly reminded of the most powerful being on the planet, and that is uh, water. Water is beyond more powerful than anything. It's more powerful than metal, more powerful than wood, more powerful than anything that humans can try to build. None of us can can match what water does. So I, I'm going to present a video, but I think just before that I want to share something. And an, another challenge I had was getting to the, to the river to find stones because I want to gift each of you, I wanted to gift each of you a stone, but I'm going to gift you a metaphorical element of what a stone is because I see each and every one of you as being that stone that you drop in the water and the ripple effect. Being able to come to a conference like this and do all the different workshops and attend everything, you're, you're absorbing a lot. And I appreciate what each and every one of you are doing from the attendees to the media to our incredible technicians who we couldn't do anything without. Thank you for your work. And um, because it's one thing to do our work, but to have it shared, we, we need a team. And we need a team to save this planet. Because in my language, the name for, for uh, the Earth is Temeach. And we say, Tisha Temeach. If you want to share that with me. Tisha Temeach is Mother Earth. So, um, it's always so foreign coming into these buildings, but I often remind myself that where there's cement, that is earth, and that earth came from the ground, and we 
transformed it again with water and built, uh, built this building that we can do our work in today. And amongst the plants that I was able to, to find, <laughs> we lucked on a really great nursery that was starting to put things away and we managed to get a couple of treasures. So they're, um, they have, we have two versions of, uh, of juniper, this little one here. This is more what you would find on the Pacific Northwest coast. It's juniper. And juniper is a medicine we use for uh, expelling um, disease and unhealthy elements in our body. And uh, in the early days when the settlers arrived here on Turtle Island, they would actually get uh, juniper berries and keep them in their pockets. And when they would visit, they used to do house visits. So when the doctors would come to do their visits, they would take a juniper berry and chew on it to not absorb the uh, viruses and bacteria of the homes they visited. And so today, here we are in a pandemic and we're wearing masks. I'm not wearing them right now, but I will be again. Um, but we're reminded of, of those elements of what the natural world does for us and how it helps us to care for ourselves, to protect our well-being and our healthiness. And uh, this was the closest thing to, uh, to a deer fern I could find. Apparently it's from Florida, but when I spoke with the florist, he was quite fascinated how much I knew about it. And for us, the deer fern looks exactly like this and it grows straight up. And the fiddleheads are really palatable, they're good food. And in the winter, the stem turns almost black and we dry those out and we weave, we weave uh, intricate embellishments into our cedar and spruce root baskets. And so then the final one, uh, yeah, so this other one is a juniper as well, but it looks a lot more like our Pacific Northwest Coast red cedar. And this one was quite a treasure thinking about how, um, thinking about the shoreline. And where I live, uh, this plant used to live on our shorelines and it doesn't live there anymore. Um, because the first thing you see when you go to the beach in my neighborhood are several tankers, oil tankers. And it's the, it's the tankers that are killing our whales and they're killing our foods on the shore and they're affecting, uh, they're affecting all the rivers that come and flow from the mountains to feed our shorelines. So I wanted to have plants, and yes, I put plastic down because it's a carpet, so I hope I have not offended anybody, but I don't want to leave a mess when I leave here. And I just wanted to bring something real that represents the forest where I'm from and the forests of many places of Turtle Island and, um, and the things that it brings to us in wellness. The, um, yes, the plants give us oxygen and more importantly, uh, the lichens and the fungi are what give us the, the pure air. They filter everything bad out. And a lot of people I've known for years feel a bit afraid of mushrooms or fungi, but literally when you're in a rainforest, they're floating all around you and they're keeping the air clean. It's like living in a giant uh, air purifier when you're in a, a beautiful rainforest. And so for me, the most heartbreaking thing that's going on in the planet is the loss of our our forests and living in BC we get a little bit uh, spoiled because even in Vancouver you can drive 20 minutes and be in the heart of a, a rainforest surrounded by what many people think are ancient trees but to put it in context an ancient tree an, an, uh, an old growth tree is 250 years old and beyond that everything, if you were fortunate enough to see a thousand year old cedar, you would be touching on an ancient forest. So um, my video presentation is gonna bring you to the shore 
and it's something I hope that you'll embrace. There are no people in this video. There is just the ocean and the forest. The Schwen i Stuckstuck. Schwen i Stuckstuck. Schwen i Stuckstuck. The Schwen is the ocean and the Stuckstuck is the forest. So I'm gonna, I wanna, sh I wanna share these pebbles and then we're gonna turn on the video. Um, and I just wanna bring you guys to the Pacific Northwest Coast for a short moment. It's about a 15 minute video and I feel like it's a very soothing uh, video, the ocean, the, the animals you're gonna hear and see and I hope that this helps you all with the time that you spend at this conference, with the many things you'll be doing, that this becomes a place that you can remind yourself of the meditative moment that you shared with each other as delegates. So I just want to raise my hands to you all for being here and for the work you're doing. Hoichuch.
So, thank you. <laughs> Before um, Cease is going to continue with her little workshop and explaining also the film, um, I would like, of course, to say thank you again mm -hmm. to our partners, WWF and Expertise France. I think some of you are here as well. And uh, without you, we would not be able to, to do this work. So our partners since the beginning, uh, organizational but also funding partners are really um, pivotal for us and also that you are trusting us in, in our work. And I would like to remind um, you that we are going to have a panel discussion, not a real panel discussion, it's a fishbowl discussion afterwards, after this workshop and performance in this smaller room over there and we have an amazing group of uh, speakers from all over the world. I think we we have all the continents present and I'm really very happy and grateful that they could come and CES is going to make a transition in between the workshop and performance. Actually the performance will be the transition to lead you into the discussion room and a fishbowl discussion means that everybody is part of it, not only the speakers and the moderator, but the audience from the first moment on. And um, that's one of um, our ideas of our projects that everybody is involved. Collaboration is really important, bringing different people and stakeholders together, different groups, and that everybody gets a voice. But now I hand over the microphone back to our dear artist, Cis. Hachka. Yeah, so... Um, all the the very beginning, um, as I was sharing before, that where I live, we look out and see the tankers, and so I I wanted to start with that to show what what our communities are facing on the coast. Um, as I was pre preparing to come out here, some of the news that I scrolled by that really broke my heart was another two whales washed up on the shorelines in Haida Gwaii. Definitely tanker hits. Um, massive, great, massive uh, humpback whales that were, that just rolled up on the shoreline there. So it's very real. Um, I'm reminded of a few years ago when a, a mother killer whale in the Southern Salish Seas uh, gave birth to her, her baby and because of the lack of uh, fatty salmon, the Chinook salmon in particular, uh, when the mother was pregnant, she did not make her baby fat enough to float. And so her, uh, her baby killer whale passed away and she spent two weeks around the Seattle Harbor with it on her nose, going up to shorelines and looking at humans with her whale, her, her dead baby. And I, I was actually kind of shocked that some people asked what that meant. And I, I'm pretty sure that each and every one of you knows what that means, that she understood as this sentient being that, um, that we're responsible for her child's death. And so, you know, people look at the ocean and they, they don't always see what's below. And it's a big part of the West Coast. Uh, people, whatever nation you go to, we have stories of the underworld. We have stories of what goes on under the water. And uh, the salmon are the most important uh, food in our whole life and we're, very close to losing that. As a child, my, my parents would go fishing uh, my whole life, and I have a beautiful photo of them. They're both about my height, we're all short, <laughs> but they're holding each three spring salmon and their backs are curved and they're trying to hold it and you can just see the strain on their face trying to each hold two or three salmon that are almost the same length as their body. So these are the those were spring salmon. And um, it's the most important food for the uh, southern resident killer whales. And I know there are killer whales all around the planet. And I know that some of them eat seals. I've had a lot of arguments with European settlers who have told me, oh, they can just eat a seal. And it's like, 
Well, you know, it's like indigenous people. We all have our unique foods. And what is good for me is not going to be good for someone else, maybe. I know a lot of my prairie friends come to Vancouver and they're like, oh, you guys eat so much fish. Oh, you eat those soap berries. They're so hard to, they're so bitter, all these things. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I'm sure you have foods that are hard for me, but I, I would argue, I guess, because I love buffalo and I love whitefish and I love all, all the good things that I've eaten in the many nations I've visited. So really the most important things to us are the forest and the ocean. And I, what I, again, drawing back in case people missed that, the, the chickpea that I gave you is symbolic of a stone. And that stone is to, uh, to go home and be a positive influence in your community. Uh, somebody also asked me when I was passing it out, can I plant this? Yes, you can. It's a seed. You can plant that. Um, that's why we can't carry things across borders. We, you know, we try. We sneak things through sometimes, but it's um, the, the, we affect the biodiversity, and that's what this is all about, the nature positive, and to take care of what we have and to cherish it for the rest of our lives. So in this, in this work, I shared with you the same uh, body of water that you started out looking at with those tankers is the same body of water that I shot the footage in that wintry scene in that cove. And that was within two days, just to put it in a context. It wasn't months apart. And there, because of the snow and the fog, you actually can only see a certain distance, but if that wasn't there, you would have seen about 15 tankers. And, and the work that we have done on the Pacific Northwest Coast and many of my colleagues that are here today, even right here in the room with us, have been on those front lines to, uh, to stop the tanker traffic, but most importantly, to, to shut down uh, international fish farms that are uh, creating waste that is not only polluting the waters uh, around them, but it is literally creating, it is attracting this fish lice that is uh, eating the small young salmon as they're trying to make their way up the inlet, the many inlets on the Pacific Northwest Coast. And um, it's, it's an endless job that we'll all keep fighting, we'll all keep contributing to putting uh, an end to these um, invasive energies and species and companies that do not come and contribute to, they're not hiring people in our community, not that any of us want to work there, but they're also, they're not bringing anything back into our economy. And if the salmon and the whales were there, our, we would not even have to go and look for work. Uh, even if it wasn't about catching the salmon, just taking people out in our Pacific Northwest Coast, cultural canoes, one canoe can fit from that wall to that wall, and it could carry at least half of us in here. And, um, and just going on the water and showing people the beauty. I've, I've spent many years uh, working in an ecotourism company to bring people on the water, and we have to paddle right past the Shell oil refinery that has been leaking gas in our inlet for uh, about 15 years, and none of the scientists they have can fix it. None of them. They've all worked on it. And then next to it is Kinder Morgan, which is really every Canadian here and there all across Canada, we are now the ones that own that pipeline. And and that's a travesty. So a lot of people don't see it, so it's easy to not think about it. But we've had two spills in that inlet in the last 50 years. And to put it in another context, right where that oil refinery is and the gas refinery is the place that our killer whales uh, on the west coast, the southern resident killer whales, would come there to give birth to their babies because it's a massive saltwater inlet. And the amount of food in that inlet is unbelievable. 
the clams, the oysters, the mussels, the, the prawns, the shrimp, the salmon, so many salmon, many types of salmon. So we've lost all of that in my lifetime. And I have a grandchild who's six, and I have another grandchild on the way. My fear is that, she's, that both of these children are not going to know what an ancient cedar looks like and that they're not going to know what salmon tastes like. And just when we thought, at least we still have our wild berries, now we're fighting with the provincial government who are spraying pests. They're doing pest management. And amongst the plants that they see as pests, the last um, image that you saw on there, the tiny little uh, plants in the moss were red huckleberry. So they're about the size of my, my pinky. They're very small. They take, um, they take seven years to produce berries. They can only thrive with uh, living and decaying red cedar trees. So uh, with the yellow cedars who live way up in the mountains, they need to live with the wild blueberries. These plants are known as vacciniums in the Latin names. And as the name implies, they protect our health, our well-being. They can prevent everything from colon cancer to all kinds of blood diseases to uh, including, you know, um, basically like anemia and everything else. And so without that relationship with the forest and the ocean, because the, on the other thing that feeds those plants are the shells. That's why I did a lot of focus on the shells in this piece so that people could be reminded of what they are. And again, at that beginning scene, uh, our village sites in, Stan in, in what is now known as Stanley Park, um, it's in the middle of the city. My community is entrenched with urbanization. We don't have a lot of quiet, sacred spaces. Most of them are being clear cut. And so at one time, the shell heaps were so massive that if you were coming over the horizon and around the corner, you would see these massive white piles, predominantly white from the oysters, but speckled in with the mussels and clams. And you would know there's a village there that I'm going to. I'm going to arrive at that village. And the first thing that was taken from that area were the shells. And they were dispersed to make the road that has become known as Park Drive around Stanley Park. When we lost that, we lost our villages. We were dispersed. We were placed onto reserves. And then we were, um, and then our children were taken and it continued. Many other bad things happened. But also what happened was the shoreline health that affects everybody, even the settlers that came in and removed that. It, it removed the foods and other uh, sea life that comes to the shoreline to eat. So my neighbor has noticed in the last two years that all the starfish are disappearing around Stanley Park. And they're also disappearing through the inlet closer to the uh, oil refineries. So it's up to each and every one of us. So when I, when I handed out those symbolic stones, I wasn't just giving you a gift. I was pleading with you to make it the most important thing to each and every one of you to consider how do I make an, an effective change at home. One of the things that I've done um, as Anne-Marie is saying about plants with me, I've, I've dedicated many years to training the next generation uh, indigenous youth to know what plants are and to know how to plant them and how to care for them. And we have gone to sites to remediate and restore. And it is the thing that, it is the reason I'm here because everything I've seen about this, uh, this conference is about us restoring and remediating. And, and everything I watch in the form of documentaries and articles I read, I want to have hope. I want to have hope that we're all going to make it and that our next generations, whether, we ha we're, whether any of you have children or not, there will be generations in your family ahead of you that you 
hope we'll see and know the tiniest little plant to the largest. So some of the work I've done is going into these forests to document uh, creatures, the, the, um, the bears, the owls, flying squirrels, all of those things that a lot of people never see, so they think they're gone. But they're there. It's just that we have to stop entrenching those forests. I've crawled into a 2,000-year-old cedar to sit and, and think about what it is for a bear in the wintertime that needs to go and sleep for six to eight months and give birth to their next generation and that they crawl out in the spring and the berries are coming out and feeding them. And one such tree I did crawl in and out of was surrounded uh, for hundreds and hundreds of feet with a canopy of wild blueberries about up to my hips. Another forest I walk through, um, we have a special medicine at home called Devil's Club. I, I wear a rhizome of it on my, on my neck. It, it is soft in the middle, so it's easy to make into a bead. But these, they're called Devil's Club because they're, the plant is so filled with thorns, uh, to touch it would be terrifying. I, I've been hit, I've had a thorn in my hand and it paralyzed my hand for four days in the winter. So I know that the power of that medicine is strong. We never pick it in the winter, we only pick it in the warm climate. But most of the Devil's Club in my area, the leaves are about this high. And I went to the inland temperate rainforest in the Kootenays last year, and I was walking under a canopy of Devil's Club leaves that were above my head. And it was only a postage stamp forest that was left with only four ancient cedars that are left in that pocket. And the rest, everything around it, has been decimated. And so people think when they come to BC, oh, there's so much trees, there's so much forest. It's disappearing. It's not going to be there long. And if we don't commit our future with children knowing the s most simple things about plants and how to care for them, and it doesn't have to be what I've brought. It's from where any of you are to think and consider how can we bring young people onto the land and restore areas that are decimated, filled with invasive species, and literally dying. So one thing that I know is that a great teacher of mine made an analogy of, of colonization to me, and she, she showed me a handful of dirt. And she said, this is colonization. This dirt has nothing. It is, it is almost, uh, it is just gray, and there's no life that can grow in it. And then she showed me in her other hand rich, dark, humus soil that had been fed by the forest and leaves decomposing everything. And she's like, this is soil. It is rich. It is decolonized. It is filled with life. It can bring life. It can, it can keep your family alive. It can be turned into many things. But mainly, it can feed the plants that give us oxygen, that bring us life. So I thought that was an amazing analogy. And it really told me, how, how do we take things and turn them around? So before I carry on, I want everybody to, uh, I know it's hard with these masks. I usually do this in a forest, too. But I want you to all take three big breaths in. And each time that you breathe in, you count to three and hold it for a second, and then release it slowly. Because, because the air, as much as the ocean and the water, is very vital to us. So yeah, one, two, three. So 
it's raining out there, and the next time you go outside, I'm going to challenge you to give yourself that moment to take care of your body and your heart and your mind, and to do that for a moment and to take those breaths and just in your mind compare what the difference was from being in this big room, this temperature controlled climate. Thank goodness there's some live plants here to give us extra oxygen, but, but just to take that moment to care for yourself and to hug a tree when you're called to it and to not be embarrassed because our trees are our grandparents. They are our ancestors. And when you're having a really hard day and you can't talk to people, sometimes the only thing you can do is hold on to something that's going to give you hope. And that's, what, uh, that's my best free advice to anybody, is to remind yourself you're doing this work. How can you take yourself forward? How can you go to the next level uh, to help your communities? And if it's not your community you live in, how can you help the community that you live with and that you are a part of? Because not everybody, I'm very fortunate. I often think I'm spoiled because I live where all my family is from, where my ancestors are from. And even that park that I live a few blocks from and was recently uh, given a studio space in the park it's right where my ancestors had been kicked out a hundred years ago. So when I go there, I'm, I'm overjoyed because for the first time in my whole life, I'm somewhere that I'm really supposed to be and I'm always with my ancestors. I um, you probably noticed my tattoos, but I'm gonna talk about one of them and it's the one here is, uh, a signature from my great, 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 great grandmother. She married, she met and married a Hawaiian man and uh, they met at Fort Langley, which is also known as Kwantlen. And they traveled by canoe down the river, down what is known as the Fraser River. We know it as Stalo River. And they went to New Westminster for a short time, and then they learned about the Hastings Mill being built in Vancouver, what, what wasn't even Vancouver yet, was just Hastings Mill town site. And that town site turned into a massive uh, urban development, which is now known as the city of Vancouver. But they lived there for a short while, and they were kicked out because she had by then acquired pigs and chickens and geese, and they ran all over the town site and annoyed their boss, the owner of the town. Then he asked them to move. And at the time, another man came there, and that's my grandfather, my six generations back grandfather. So my grandmother had two Hawaiian husbands. Her first husband invited the second husband to live with him and her. And they built uh, several buildings and established what became known as Kanaka Ranch. And they, uh, they did everything to develop that land and to live while the uh, Europeans came in and gave our land away to settlers. And then they kicked our family and all of our community out of the park. So she was one of the last ones to hold on to land, and that's how I found her signature. She went to what was then a canvas tent that was City Hall, and she demanded to be heard, and she wrote a letter. She had her son, who could speak English, Hawaiian, and Skomish, uh, translate that she was not giving up her land. And so we still have all that beauty and richness and resilience from her. And we know our family because she, without knowing it, became written into the history books of this colonial city. Um, I'm going to wind down now, and I would like to invite uh, those of you who are interested to come into our panel fishbowl discussion. And I'd like to hold my hands up. We do this 
I discovered one day when I was in the forest looking at the giant red cedars that I noticed their boughs came down and they, their boughs were like this. And I realized that when we do that, it's to honor people, to thank them. And I teach this to little children. I tell them the red cedar is always honoring you. It's always watching out for you. Um, if you ever come to Vancouver, just know this. The trees you see that you might think are massive are baby trees. Even that picture over there kind of indicates an old forest. I'm sure that forest was logged. That's what most of the BC coast looks like. We have to go a long ways to find even an 800-year-old cedar. So uh, let's hope that every plant, every cedar, and every other tree we plant is seen by the next 20 generations ahead of us, and that they are also telling that same story. Heichka Osiem on Hatskwalowans. I've just said that my heart feels lifted, and I'm very thankful to be with you all today. Osiem. Thank you very much, Cees. So um, I think we learned a lot about, um, not only about British Columbia and plants and the ocean and protection and um, traditional knowledge and your communities, but also how an artist is not only a visual artist, but she's engaged in community work. She is engaged, uh, engaged in um, educational projects. She's, she's working with young people. And uh, she brings across not only the idea of visual art, but of botany as well, and of plants. So whenever you participate in her workshops, you go out with absolutely with, with more knowledge, and you understand, and, and you touch the plants in a different way. I didn't know that fern is eatable. And um, I always learn a lot through, um, well, I indigenous people. I recently went to Sápmi, to the north of Sweden, and in Sweden, uh, there are still indigenous peoples as well. And I learned that you can eat the leaves of the birch, and it's actually giving you a lot of vitamin C. So we learn a lot of practical, um, or we get a lot of practical knowledge as well. And um, this is our idea with Artport as well. We don't only produce nice art exhibitions and write uh, texts which nobody understands, but we really try to contribute to societal change through artistic work and connecting it to science and to community work. So for the ones who are interested, um, I would like to lead you over to our little panel room over there and introduce you to our uh, guest speakers and explain a little bit the fishbowl discussion and talk a little bit more uh, about the idea of nature positive, of course. That's why we are here and how the project is, uh, is part of that. So um, we leave our friends, the plants here, or oh, there are questions. Do you want to have the microphone because you cannot hear? Nobody can actually hear you, sorry. Thank you. I come from New Channels Nations, and thank you very much for your presentation. It was wonderful to see images of the coast um, where neighboring nations. The image in the room over there is among New Channels Nation territory as well. Those are coastal temperate rainforests. They're the original, and they are VR headsets, virtual reality headsets. There's a film that's been put out by Nature United there that I helped to narrate. And so if you want to go and put that on after, there's, you can see 12,000-year-old tree that is in my homeland. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, I would really love to invite you to come over to our little panel room. It's going to be cozy and a little bit more familiar and our family style. And then um, I invite you as the audience as well to be part of the discussion from the first moment on. And thank you so much for, uh, for um, being here for the workshop. Thank you. One more thing. Oh, yeah. And I just want to invite uh, people that uh, feel uh, they'd like to, at least for the duration of the workshop. There's some small plants here that if you'd like to hold on to while we're in this workshop and just uh, take, 
take a moment to know it. And if you have questions about it, please ask me. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea.